Hello and welcome to the WISS Journal, Public Affairs from 104.9. I'm Paul Kretschmer. On today's broadcast, we'll be hearing about the Prison Fellowship Academy program to create lasting change. And we'll be speaking with Cody Wild, Vice President of Correctional Programs at Prison Fellowship. Yeah, yeah. So I work for Prison Fellowship. I'm the Vice President of Correctional Programs. And so I oversee all of our in-prison activity for the country. For the entire country. Uh, and your location is where? Uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, but our, you know, uh, organization's headquarters is in Northern Virginia. Okay, I suppose, do as they like to say, due to technology nowadays, you can be almost any place and still get the we, job done. Exactly. We are predominantly um, uh, remote, and I, I say I work from my house and the uh, Minneapolis airport. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I've passed through Minneapolis before. That's quite a large location. It is, you know, it's it's, it's great because you know, direct flights almost everywhere, flying Delta. Yeah. Okay. Um, as far as the responsibility that you have uh, concerned, could you describe for listeners a little bit about what you do? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, me specifically or prison fellowship? Um, both. Okay. Yeah. So, prison fellowship is um, the nation's largest um, outreach to prisoners and their families. Uh, we started in. 1976, founded by uh, Chuck Colson, who went to prison um, for Watergate-related um, crimes. He was a part of Nixon's administration. And, um, we've gone through multiple evolutions uh, over the years, um, but really with this, this central focus of uh, partnering with the Lord and the local church uh, to accomplish his purposes inside and outside of prison. And so what I get to oversee is all of our in-prison activity, um, if you think about a prison or a state uh, like an ecosystem, um, at the, the, the core of that, the tip of the spear, are the men and women who live behind bars. Um, our uh, in-prison programs are there to equip and empower those who live in prison to be change agents. Um, so our cornerstone program is called the Prison Fellowship Academy. Um, that takes individuals on a year-long journey uh, to be transformed individually and to be a part of the transformation of a prison system. Um, in addition to that, um, we want to pair those who live in prison with those who work in prison. Um, so we have an innovative program called the Warden Exchange, which is a transformational leadership program for correctional officials to reimagine what prison could be, not just centers, um, or places of, of um, punishment, but also centers of restoration. Um, so that's where we really try to pair those who live in prison with those who work in prison to work together uh, to change culture and to change lives. Um, we do evangelistic events around the country called HOPE events. Um, those are yard events for anybody uh, to participate in. Um, our largest program that we have at Prison Fellowship is called Angel Tree. Um, and that's where a parent who's incarcerated can sign up to have a Christmas present delivered to their kids um, at Christmas time on their behalf. Um, and so we partner with uh, churches all around the country to, to purchase the gifts um, and to deliver it to, for them to the children at Christmas time. And we do that in all 50 states. And it's really a way to connect local families with local churches, um, you know, hoping that uh, that sparks a relationship between uh, the children, the caregiver, and those churches, and really forms a year-round uh, partnership and collaboration. And then, you know, additionally, we um, do criminal justice reform um, to try to affect you know, how people get to prison, what happens while they're there, and to remove obstacles and barriers upon release. So Prison Fellowship is a holistic organization looking at all different facets of um, crime and incarceration, but with um, uh, a sincere belief in um, the, the redemptive power of Jesus Christ um, and how we might work with him um, toward achieving those ends. Speaking of, of the, the result you just mentioned, I understand that there's been some programming going on at Prison Fellowship, which, which in some locations, at least I believe North Dakota may be the location, mm -hmm. has resulted in a reduced recidivism, which for people who um, don't hear that word very often has to do with how often someone goes into a lockup and then comes out and then does something and then goes back in again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So you might be referring to there's a study done in Minnesota by the Minnesota Department of Corrections. Um, 
It's also one done in Texas, at the um, Texas Department of Criminal Justice, um, did some evaluations on our programs. And yes, recidivism does measure, um, there, there are different definitions of recidivism, um, but uh, it does measure, you know, people are being reincarcerated. Um, and our programs did show human flourishing. Um, the people are becoming good citizens. They're becoming proactive members of society. Um, you know, with the belief that if a person is growing and becoming a person with more integrity, um, that they are more affirming of the gifts and abilities of other people, they're becoming more productive, if they're becoming more responsible, more restorative, if they're seeking out and building up pro-social community, um, that the, the bad things take care of themselves. And so it's not so much asking the question, why do people go to prison? It's why don't people go to prison? And how do we instill that? Um, as the through line throughout all of our programs. Now, as far as that's concerned, then does that does that include, for the most part, people who have gone through a redemption experience through Jesus Christ, or does that apply to a, a wider prison follow, um, population where an inmate hasn't made that declaration, and but still, for instance, shows the kind of the reduction in rate that that you mentioned a moment ago. Yes, I, I'm here. Okay, okay, now I can hear you. Yeah, um, does that include people who have, have met Jesus Christ behind bars, or does that include people also who haven't? Um, the, the recidivism rates? Yes. Yeah, so that, that's not a part of the, the equation. Um, and so what we're really asking is, you know, in all of our programs, a person is going to encounter Jesus. Um, you know, we are an unashamed Christian organization, but uh, the programs that have been measured are open to people of any faith or no religious practice. What we would say is everybody has a place to belong, regardless of what they believe. And we're going to teach from this angle. Um, but, you know, um, it's, it's between you and the Lord um, to, to make that decision. And so we try to actually take an approach um, more akin to, in, in Acts 8, um, the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, where the Lord tells Philip, just get close to this chariot. It uh, doesn't tell him much else. He gets there and he hears the Ethiopian man reading aloud the, the book of Isaiah. I mean, it's about Jesus. And he asks him, you know, what's that about? And he's like, I don't know. How can, how can I know unless somebody tells me? Um, so Philip explains it to him and he journeys with the man and he comes to faith. Um, our approach is very similar. Um, we journey with people that are, are programming and our curriculum really functions like that um, book of Isaiah in that story. Um, but we stay close to people. We respond to the questions they're asking rather than beginning with answers to questions nobody's asking. Um, we've seen many people come to know the Lord um, through that. Um, but there are you know, certainly people who go through the program. Um, they aren't believers when they come in, you know, and we don't know if they're believers or not um, upon completion. Um, but who have become better citizens, um, <laughs> that they're um, growing in their integrity, that they're seeking out better community. And so we really see that as um, in addition to, you know, sharing the gospel, the explicit gospel of Christ's death um, and resurrection. There's also an element of common grace there um, that as a response to the gospel, we also want to <laughs> um, uh create a culture and to um, inflict a culture with um, the values that really mirror the kingdom of God. As far as your acceptance within the um, correctional facility system, and what sorts of things briefly does prison fellowship need to do in order to be welcome in, in a facility to work uh, the way it does, mm -hmm. aside from the result that may, uh, may come? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so at the end of the day, um, you know, the, the two main questions that corrections are going to be asking you know, people in uh, correctional leadership is, one, does it work? Mm. <laughs> because if it doesn't work, it doesn't really matter. Um, and two, um, are you, um, you know, respecting the rights of the people who are here? Um, and so if those two things are met and we are... Um, uh, creating the, the most effective programs that are out there. And it truly is open to anybody, you know, that we're not coercive. Um, you know, we want to embody something that's beautiful, the gospel to become real to a person's senses. Um, and they're going to hear the explicit 
um, gospel, but it's all invitational. Um, it's not a condition for acceptance into the community. Um, and so if those two things are met, uh, you know, there are a lot of problems in the world and um, we find that uh, there really isn't much resistance at that point. You know, we don't take any government money, so there's no you know, financial um, transaction there. And so we provide these effective programs at no cost to the state um, and try to bring hope, which creates safer environments. And who can disagree with that? In terms of the uh, people who work uh, inside uh, lockups, then are they all volunteer uh, coming from prison fellowship? Then do you take people from the community? In other words, yeah. So it's it's a combination of both. So we have staff all around the country. Um, in one of our in prison models, our most intensive program called the uh, the Tier Two Prison Fellowship Academy, um, we actually have a full time prison fellowship staff member inside of one prison. And they lead programming during the day, uh, do one-on-one -on -one, uh, case planning with participants, mm -hmm. and then still leverage volunteers in the evening. In the vast majority of our um, program models, um, we utilize volunteers from local churches um, to facilitate content um, in the evenings. And you know, staff and volunteers bring complementary uh, functions into the, the prison. Um, and so one isn't a replacement for the other, but they work in tandem. Um, and so, yeah, we are very, very much dependent upon um, the, the local church um, in, in communities around. And circling back around to the starting point of our conversation, then, mm -hmm. uh, are there any other details or points um, that a release I saw um, would include that you have not had the opportunity to mention yet for listeners? You know, um, at the... Part of Chuck Colson's vision uh, when he founded Prison Fellowship, he really saw um, the organization as working alongside uh, the local church. Um, that is the bride of Christ. That is God's plan for the restoration of the world. Um, and so we are you know, seeking to continue to do that, to ennoble the church, um, to be that prophetic voice. Um, from behind the prison walls uh, to get the church on the outside proximate to what the Lord is already doing on the inside, that there is a church behind the prison walls. Um, and so that's just very important that we are, you know, fundamentally a ministry of proximity, of um, trying to get people from the outside proximate to what the Lord's doing on the inside and really seeing the impact um, is going both ways, both how people on the outside can impact change on the inside but then as people from the outside get proximate to what the Lord's doing on the inside, uh, that they themselves are changed and bring that back into their communities on the outside. It sounds, um, on the face of it, initially, um, can you, a, a listener who has any familiarity at all with, with um, the life of the Apostle Paul cannot help but see the, the similarity. Absolutely. You know, we're a, an equipping ministry, a multiplying ministry, um, and it's with those that have been forgotten are actually at the center of the solution here. If a listener would like to know more, since some of your responsibility is nationwide, could you give them a contact point at least nationally, if not in a region? Yeah, I would just say visit our website at prisonfellowship.org. Um, it's going to have a list of all of our different program areas, um, as well as ways that you can uh, participate in those um, wherever you are. Thank you very much for the generosity of your time today, Cody. I very much appreciate talking to you one-on-one. -on -one. Absolutely. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Once again, to recap some of what I spoke about with Cody Willie just now, Prison Fellowship's program aims to do a renewal and restoration in a person. It's a year-long curriculum aiming to create lasting change in the academy works. According to Prison Fellowship in Minnesota, a study verified that graduates of the pro program had a 0.8% recidivism rate compared to the state's 40%. Studies like these appear to prove the effectiveness of the academy in improving not only the lives of incarcerated individuals, but the communities they enter upon release. For further information, call us at 860-346-1049. Or you can email us, office at wihsradio.org. The opinions expressed are those of the participants, not necessarily those of the staff or management of the station. I'm Paul Kretschmer for the WIHS Journal, Public Affairs from 104.9 WIHS.